Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 28 Summer Passed By The Sterling clan, with the insignificant exception of cousin Georgiana, had tacitly agreed to follow Uncle James' example and look upon Valancy as one dead. To be sure, Valancy had an unquiet, ghostly habit of recurring resurrections when she and Barney clattered through Deerwood and out to the port in that unspeakable car. Valancy, bareheaded, with stars in her eyes. Barney, bareheaded, smoking his pipe. But shaved. Always shaved now, if any of them had noticed it. They even had the audacity to go into Uncle Benjamin's store to buy groceries. Twice Uncle Benjamin ignored them. Was not Valancy one of the dead? While Snaith had never existed. But the third time he told Barney he was a scoundrel who should be hung for luring an unfortunate, weak-minded girl away from her home and friends. Barney's one straight eyebrow went up. I have made her happy, he said coolly and she was miserable with her friends. So that's that. Uncle Benjamin stared. It had never occurred to him that women had to be, or ought to be, made happy. You, you pup, he said. Why be so unoriginal, queried Barney amiably. Anybody could call me a pup. Why not think of something worthy of the Sterlings? Besides, I'm not a pup. I'm really quite a middle-aged dog. 35, if you're interested in knowing. Uncle Benjamin remembered just in time that Valancy was dead. He turned his back on Barney. Valancy was happy, gloriously and entirely so. She seemed to be living in a wonderful house of life and every day opened a new, mysterious room. It was in a world which had nothing in common with the one she had left behind, a world where time was not, which was young with immortal youth where there was neither past nor future but only the present. She surrendered herself utterly to the charm of it. The absolute freedom of it all was unbelievable. They could do exactly as they liked. No Mrs. Grundy. No traditions. No relatives. Or in-laws. Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away, as Barney quoted shamelessly. Valancy had gone home once and got her cushions. And cousin Georgiana had given her one of her famous candlewick spreads of most elaborate design. For your spare room bed, dear, she said. But I haven't got any spare room, said Valancy. Cousin Georgiana looked horrified. A house without a spare room was monstrous to her. But it's a lovely spread, said Valancy, with a kiss and I'm so glad to have it. I'll put it on my own bed. Barney's old patchwork quilt is getting ragged. I don't see how you can be contented to live up back, sighed cousin Georgiana. It's so out of the world. Contented. Valancy laughed. What was the use of trying to explain to cousin Georgiana? It is, she agreed, most gloriously and entirely out of the world. And you are really happy, dear, asked cousin Georgiana wistfully. I really am, said Valancy gravely, her eyes dancing. Marriage is such a serious thing, sighed cousin Georgiana. When it's going to last long, agreed Valancy. Cousin Georgiana did not understand this at all. But it worried her and she lay awake at nights wondering what Valancy meant by it. Valancy loved her blue castle and was completely satisfied with it. The big living room had three windows, all commanding exquisite views of exquisite mistawis. The one in the end of the room was an oriel window, which Tom McMurray, Barney explained, had got out of some little, old, up-back church that had been sold. It faced the west and when the sunsets flooded it Valancy's whole being knelt in prayer as if in some great cathedral. The new moons always looked down through it, the lower pine boughs swayed about the top of it, and all through the nights the soft, dim silver of the lake dreamed through it. 
there was a stone fireplace on the other side. No desecrating gas imitation but a real fireplace where you could burn real logs. With a big grizzly bearskin on the floor before it, and beside it a hideous, red plush sofa of Tom McMurray's regime. But its ugliness was hidden by silver-gray timber wolf skins, and Valency's cushions made it gay and comfortable. In a corner a nice, tall, lazy old clock ticked, the right kind of a clock. One that did not hurry the hours away but ticked them off deliberately. It was the jolliest looking old clock. A fat, corpulent clock with a great, round, man's face painted on it, the hand stretching out of its nose and the hours encircling it like a halo. There was a big glass case of stuffed owls and several deer heads, likewise of Tom McMurray's vintage. Some comfortable old chairs that asked to be sat upon. A squat little chair with a cushion was prescriptively Banjo's. If anybody else dared sit on it Banjo glared him out of it with his topaz-hued, black-ringed eyes. Banjo had an adorable habit of hanging over the back of it, trying to catch his own tail. Losing his temper because he couldn't catch it. Giving it a fierce bite for spite when he did catch it. Yowling malignantly with pain. Barney and Valency laughed at him until they ached. But it was good luck they loved. They were both agreed that good luck was so lovable that he practically amounted to an obsession. One side of the wall was lined with rough, homemade bookshelves filled with books, and between the two side windows hung an old mirror in a faded gilt frame, with fat cupids gambling in the panel over the glass. A mirror, Valency thought, that must be like the fabled mirror into which Venus had once looked and which thereafter reflected as beautiful every woman who looked into it. Valency thought she was almost pretty in that mirror. But that may have been because she had shingled her hair. This was before the day of Bob's and was regarded as a wild, unheard of proceeding, unless you had typhoid. When Mrs. Frederick heard of it she almost decided to erase Valency's name from the family Bible. Barney cut the hair, square off at the back of Valency's neck, bringing it down in a short black fringe over her forehead. It gave a meaning and a purpose to her little, three-cornered face that it never had possessed before. Even her nose ceased to irritate her. Her eyes were bright, and her sallow skin had cleared to the hue of creamy ivory. The old family joke had come true, she was really fat at last, anyway, no longer skinny. Valency might never be beautiful, but she was of the type that looks its best in the woods, elfin, mocking, alluring. Her heart bothered her very little. When an attack threatened she was generally able to head it off with Dr. Trent's prescription. The only bad one she had was one night when she was temporarily out of medicine. And it was a bad one. For the time being, Valency realized keenly that death was actually waiting to pounce on her any moment. But the rest of the time she would not, did not, let herself remember it at all. Chapter 29. Valency toiled not, neither did she spin. There was really very little work to do. She cooked their meals on a coal oil stove, performing all her little domestic rites carefully and exultingly, and they ate out on the veranda that almost overhung the lake. Before them lay Mistawis, like a scene out of some fairy tale of old time. And Barney smiling his twisted, enigmatical smile at her across the table. What have you old Tom picked out when he built this shack? Barney would say exultantly. Supper was the meal Valency liked best. The faint laughter of winds was always about them and the colors of Mistawis, imperial and spiritual, under the changing clouds were something that cannot be expressed in mere words. Shadows, too. Clustering in the pines until a wind shook them out and pursued them over Mistawis. They lay all day along the shores, threaded by ferns and wild blossoms. They stole around the headlands in the glow of the sunset, until twilight wove them all into one great web of dusk. The cats, with their wise, innocent little faces, would sit on the veranda railing and eat the tidbits Barney flung them. And how good everything tasted! Valancy, amid all the romance of Mistawis, 
never forgot that men had stomachs. Barney paid her no end of compliments on her cooking. After all, he admitted, there's something to be said for square meals. I've mostly got along by boiling two or three dozen eggs hard at once and eating a few when I got hungry, with a slice of bacon once in a while and a jorum of tea. Valency poured tea out of Barney's little battered old pewter teapot of incredible age. She had not even a set of dishes, only Barney's mismatched chipped bits, and a dear, big, pobby old jug of robin's egg blue. After the meal was over they would sit there and talk for hours, or sit and say nothing, in all the languages of the world, Barney pulling away at his pipe, Valency dreaming idly and deliciously, gazing at the far-off hills beyond Mistawis where the spires of firs came out against the sunset. The moonlight would begin to silver the Mistawis' dusk. Bats would begin to swoop darkly against the pale, western gold. The little waterfall that came down on the high bank not far away would, by some whim of the wildwood gods, begin to look like a wonderful white woman beckoning through the spicy, fragrant evergreens and Leander would begin to chuckle diabolically on the mainland shore. How sweet it was to sit there and do nothing in the beautiful silence, with Barney at the other side of the table, smoking. There were plenty of other islands in sight, though none were near enough to be troublesome as neighbors. There was one little group of islets far off to the west which they called the Fortunate Isles. At sunrise they looked like a cluster of emeralds, at sunset like a cluster of amethysts. They were too small for houses, but the lights on the larger islands would bloom out all over the lake, and bonfires would be lighted on their shores, streaming up into the wood shadows and throwing great, blood-red ribbons over the waters. Music would drift to them alluringly from boats here and there, or from the verandas on the big house of the millionaire on the biggest island. Would you like a house like that, Moonlight? Barney asked once, waving his hand at it. He had taken to calling her Moonlight, and Valency loved it. No, said Valency, who had once dreamed of a mountain castle ten times the size of the rich man's, cottage, and now pitted the poor inhabitants of palaces. No. It's too elegant. I would have to carry it with me everywhere I went. On my back like a snail. It would own me, possess me, body and soul. I like a house I can love and cuddle and boss. Just like ours here. I don't envy Hamilton Gossard the finest summer residence in Canada. It is magnificent, but it isn't my blue castle. Away down at the far end of the lake they got every night a glimpse of a big, continental train rushing through a clearing. Valency liked to watch its lighted windows flash by and wonder who was on it and what hopes and fears it carried. She also amused herself by picturing Barney and herself going to the dances and dinners in the houses on the islands, but she did not want to go in reality. Once they did go to a masquerade dance in the pavilion at one of the hotels up the lake, and had a glorious evening, but slipped away in their canoe, before unmasking time, back to the Blue Castle. It was lovely, but I don't want to go again, said Valency. So many hours a day Barney shut himself up in Bluebeard's chamber. Valency never saw the inside of it. From the smells that filtered through at times she concluded he must be conducting chemical experiments, or counterfeiting money. Valency supposed there must be smelly processes in making counterfeit money. But she did not trouble herself about it. She had no desire to peer into the locked chambers of Barney's house of life. His past and his future concerned her not. Only this rapturous present. Nothing else mattered. Once he went away and stayed away two days and nights. He had asked Valency if she would be afraid to stay alone and she had said she would not. He never told her where he had been. She was not afraid to be alone, but she was horribly lonely. The sweetest sound she had ever heard was Lady Jane's clatter through the woods when Barney returned. And then his signal whistle from the shore. She ran down to the landing rock to greet him, to nestle herself into his eager arms, they did seem eager. Have you missed me, Moonlight? Barney was whispering. It seems a hundred years since you went away, said Valency. 
I won't leave you again. You must, protested Valency, if you want to. I'd be miserable if I thought you wanted to go and didn't, because of me. I want you to feel perfectly free. Barney laughed, a little cynically. There is no such thing as freedom on earth, he said. Only different kinds of bondages. And comparative bondages. You think you are free now because you've escaped from a peculiarly unbearable kind of bondage. But are you? You love me, that's a bondage. Who said or wrote that, the prison unto which we doom ourselves no prison is, asked Valency dreamily, clinging to his arm as they climbed up the rock steps. Ah, now you have it, said Barney. That's all the freedom we can hope for, the freedom to choose our prison. But, moonlight, he stopped at the door of the blue castle and looked about him, at the glorious lake, the great, shadowy woods, the bonfires, the twinkling lights, moonlight, I'm glad to be home again. When I came down through the woods and saw my home lights, mine, gleaming out under the old pines, something I'd never seen before, oh, girl, I was glad, glad. But in spite of Barney's doctrine of bondage, Valency thought they were splendidly free. It was amazing to be able to sit up half the night and look at the moon if you wanted to. To be late for meals if you wanted to, she who had always been rebuked so sharply by her mother and so reproachfully by cousin Stickles if she were one minute late. Dawdle over meals as long as you wanted to. Leave your crusts if you wanted to. Not come home at all for meals if you wanted to. Sit on a sun-warm rock and paddle your bare feet in the hot sand if you wanted to. Just sit and do nothing in the beautiful silence if you wanted to. In short, do any fool thing you wanted to whenever the notion took you. If that wasn't freedom, what was? Chapter 30 They didn't spend all their days on the island. They spent more than half of them wandering at will through the enchanted Muskoka country. Barney knew the woods as a book and he taught their lore and craft to Valency. He could always find trail and haunt of the shy wood people. Valency learned the different fairy likenesses of the mosses, the charm and exquisiteness of woodland blossoms. She learned to know every bird at sight and mimic its call, though never so perfectly as Barney. She made friends with every kind of tree. She learned to paddle a canoe as well as Barney himself. She liked to be out in the rain and she never caught cold. Sometimes they took a lunch with them and went berrying, strawberries and blueberries. How pretty blueberries were, the dainty green of the unripe berries, the glossy pinks and scarlets of the half-ripes, the misty blue of the fully matured. And Valency learned the real flavor of the strawberry in its highest perfection. There was a certain sunlit dell on the banks of Mistawis along which white birches grew on one side and on the other still, changeless ranks of young spruces. There were long grasses at the roots of the birches, combed down by the winds and wet with morning dew late into the afternoons. Here they found berries that might have graced the banquets of Lucullus, great ambrosial sweetnesses hanging like rubies to long, rosy stalks. They lifted them by the stalk and ate them from it, uncrushed and virgin, tasting each berry by itself with all its wild fragrance and sphered therein. When Valency carried any of these berries home that elusive essence escaped and they became nothing more than the common berries of the marketplace, very kitchenly good indeed, but not as they would have been, eaten in their birch dell until her fingers were stained as pink as Aurora's eyelids. Or they went after water lilies. Barney knew where to find them in the creeks and bays of Mistawis. Then the blue castle was glorious with them, every receptacle that Valency could contrive filled with the exquisite things. If not water lilies then cardinal flowers, fresh and vivid from the swamps of Mistawis, where they burned like ribbons of flame. Sometimes they went trooting on little nameless rivers or hidden brooks on whose banks naiads might have sunned their white, wet limbs. Then all they took with them were some raw potatoes and salt. They roasted the potatoes over a fire and Barney showed Valency how to cook the trout by wrapping them in leaves, coating them with mud and baking them in a bed of hot coals. Never were such delicious meals. 
Valency had such an appetite it was no wonder she put flesh on her bones. Or they just prowled and explored through woods that always seemed to be expecting something wonderful to happen. At least, that was the way Valency felt about them. Down the next hollow, over the next hill, you would find it. We don't know where we're going, but isn't it fun to go? Barney used to say. Once or twice night overtook them, too far from their blue castle to get back. But Barney made a fragrant bed of bracken and fir boughs and they slept on it dreamlessly, under a ceiling of old spruces with moss hanging from them, while beyond the moonlight and the murmur of pines blended together so that one could hardly tell which was light and which was sound. There were rainy days, of course, when Muskoka was a wet green land. Days when showers drifted across Mistawis like pale ghosts of rain and they never thought of staying in because of it. Days when it rained in right good earnest and they had to stay in. Then Barney shut himself up in Bluebeard's chamber and Valency read, or dreamed on the wolfskins with good luck purring beside her and Banjo watching them suspiciously from his own peculiar chair. On Sunday evenings they paddled across to a point of land and walked from there through the woods to the little free Methodist church. One felt really too happy for Sunday. Valency had never really liked Sundays before. And always, Sundays and weekdays, she was with Barney. Nothing else really mattered. And what a companion he was. How understanding. How jolly. How, how Barney, like. That summed it all up. Valency had taken some of her $200 out of the bank and spent it in pretty clothes. She had a little smoke blue chiffon which she always put on when they spent the evening at home, smoke blue with touches of silver about it. It was after she began wearing it that Barney began calling her Moonlight. Moonlight and blue twilight, that is what you look like in that dress. I like it. It belongs to you. You aren't exactly pretty but you have some adorable beauty spots. Your eyes. And that little kissable dent just between your collar bones. You have the wrist and ankle of an aristocrat. That little head of yours is beautifully shaped. And when you look backward over your shoulder you're maddening, especially in twilight or moonlight. An elf maiden. A wood sprite. You belong to the woods, moonlight, you should never be out of them. In spite of your ancestry, there is something wild and remote and untamed about you. And you have such a nice, sweet, throaty, summery voice. Such a nice voice for lovemaking. Sure and Givi kissed the Blarney stone, scoffed Valency. But she tasted these compliments for weeks. She got a pale green bathing suit, too, a garment which would have given her clan their deaths if they had ever seen her in it. Barney taught her how to swim. Sometimes she put her bathing dress on when she got up and didn't take it off until she went to bed, running down to the water for a plunge whenever she felt like it and sprawling on the sun-warm rocks to dry. She had forgotten all the old humiliating things that used to come up against her in the night, the injustices and the disappointments. It was as if they had all happened to some other person, not to her, Valency Snaith, who had always been happy. I understand now what it means to be born again, she told Barney. Home speaks of grief, staining backward, through the pages of life, but Valency found her happiness had stained backward likewise and flooded with rose color her whole previous drab existence. She found it hard to believe that she had ever been lonely and unhappy and afraid. When death comes, I shall have lived, thought Valency. I shall have had my hour and her dust pile. One day Valency had heaped up the sand in the little island cove in a tremendous cone and stuck a gay little Union Jack on top of it. What are you celebrating? Barney wanted to know. I'm just exorcising an old demon, Valency told him. Chapter 31 Autumn came. Late September with cool nights. They had to forsake the veranda but they kindled a fire in the big fireplace and sat before it with jest and laughter. They left the doors open, and Banjo and Good Luck came and went at pleasure. 
Sometimes they sat gravely on the bearskin rug between Barney and Valency, sometimes they slunk off into the mystery of the chill night outside. The stars smoldered in the horizon mists through the old oriole. The haunting, persistent croon of the pine trees filled the air. The little waves began to make soft, sobbing splashes on the rocks below them in the rising winds. They needed no light but the firelight that sometimes leaped up and revealed them, sometimes shrouded them in shadow. When the night wind rose higher Barney would shut the door and light a lamp and read to her, poetry and essays and gorgeous, dim chronicles of ancient wars. Barney never would read novels, he vowed they bored him. But sometimes she read them herself, curled up on the wolf skins, laughing aloud in peace. For Barney was not one of those aggravating people who can never hear you smiling audibly over something you've read without inquiring placidly, what is the joke? October, with a gorgeous pageant of color around Mistawis, into which Valency plunged her soul. Never had she imagined anything so splendid. A great, tinted piece. Blue, wind-winnowed skies. Sunlight sleeping in the glades of that fairyland. Long dreamy purple days paddling idly in their canoe along shores and up the rivers of crimson and gold. A sleepy, red hunter's moon. Enchanted tempests that stripped the leaves from the trees and heaped them along the shores. Flying shadows of clouds. What had all the smug, opulent lands out front to compare with this? November, with uncanny witchery in its changed trees. With murky red sunsets flaming in smoky crimson behind the westering hills. With dear days when the austere woods were beautiful and gracious in a dignified serenity of folded hands and closed eyes, days full of a fine, pale sunshine that sifted through the late, leafless gold of the juniper trees and glimmered among the gray beaches, lighting up evergreen banks of moss and washing the colonnades of the pines. Days with a high-sprung sky of flawless turquoise. Days when an exquisite melancholy seemed to hang over the landscape and dream about the lake. But days, too, of the wild blackness of great autumn storms, followed by dank, wet, streaming nights when there was witch laughter in the pines and fitful moans among the mainland trees. What cared they? Old Tom had built his roof well, and his chimney drew. Warm fire, books, comfort, safety from storm, our cats on the rug. Moonlight, said Barney, would you be any happier now if you had a million dollars? No, nor half so happy. I'd be bored by conventions and obligations then. December. Early snows and Orion. The pale fires of the Milky Way. It was really winter now, wonderful, cold, starry winter. How Valency had always hated winter. Dull, brief, uneventful days. Long, cold, companionless nights. Cousin Stickles with her back that had to be rubbed continually. Cousin Stickles making weird noises gargling her throat in the mornings. Cousin Stickles whining over the price of coal. Her mother, probing, questioning, ignoring. Endless colds and bronchitis, or the dread of it. Red ferns liniment and purple pills. But now she loved winter. Winter was beautiful, up back, almost intolerably beautiful. Days of clear brilliance. Evenings that were like cups of glamour, the purest vintage of winter's wine. Nights with their fire of stars. Cold, exquisite winter sunrises. Lovely ferns of ice all over the windows of the blue castle. Moonlight on birches in a silver thaw. Ragged shadows on windy evenings, torn, twisted, fantastic shadows. Great silences, austere and searching. Jeweled, barbaric hills. The sun suddenly breaking through gray clouds over long, white mistawis. Icy gray twilights, broken by snow squalls, when their cozy living room, with its goblins of firelight and inscrutable cats seemed cozier than ever. Every hour brought a new revelation and wonder. Barney ran Lady Jane into Roaring Abel's barn and taught Valency how to snowshoe, Valency, who ought to be laid up with bronchitis. But Valency had not even a cold. 
Later on in the winter Barney had a terrible one and Valency nursed him through it with a dread of pneumonia in her heart. But Valency's colds seemed to have gone where old moons go. Which was luck, for she hadn't even read Fern's liniment. She had thoughtfully bought a bottle at the port and Barney had hurled it into frozen Mastawis with a scowl. Bring no more of that devilish stuff here, he had ordered briefly. It was the first and last time he had spoken harshly to her. They went for long tramps through the exquisite reticence of winter woods and the silver jungles of frosted trees, and found loveliness everywhere. At times they seemed to be walking through a spellbound world of crystal and pearl, so white and radiant were clearings and lakes and sky. The air was so crisp and clear that it was half intoxicating. Once they stood in a hesitation of ecstasy at the entrance of a narrow path between ranks of birches. Every twig and spray was outlined in snow. The undergrowth along its sides was a little fairy forest cut out of marble. The shadows cast by the pale sunshine were fine and spiritual. Come away, said Barney, turning. We must not commit the desecration of tramping through there. One evening they came upon a snowdrift far back in an old clearing which was in the exact likeness of a beautiful woman's profile. Seen too close by, the resemblance was lost, as in the fairy tale of the castle of St. John. Seen from behind, it was a shapeless oddity. But at just the right distance and angle the outline was so perfect that when they came suddenly upon it, gleaming out against the dark background of spruce in the glow of that winter sunset they both exclaimed in amazement. There was a low, noble brow, a straight, classic nose, lips and chin and cheek curve modeled as if some goddess of old time had sat to the sculptor, and a breast of such cold, swelling purity as the very spirit of the winter woods might display. All the beauty that old Greece and Rome, sung painted, taught, quoted Barney. And to think no human eyes save ours have seen or will see it, breathed Valancy, who felt at times as if she were living in a book by John Foster. As she looked around her she recalled some passages she had marked in the new Foster book Barney had brought her from the port, with an adjuration not to expect him to read or listen to it. All the tintings of winter woods are extremely delicate and elusive, recalled Valancy. When the brief afternoon wanes and the sun just touches the tops of the hills, there seems to be all over the woods an abundance, not of color, but of the spirit of color. There is really nothing but pure white after all, but one has the impression of fairy-like blendings of rose and violet, opal and heliotrope on the slopes, in the dingles and along the curves of the forest land. You feel sure the tint is there, but when you look at it directly it is gone. From the corner of your eye you are aware that it is lurking over yonder in a spot where there was nothing but pale purity a moment ago. Only just when the sun is setting is there a fleeting moment of real color. Then the redness streams out over the snow and incarnadines the hills and rivers and smites the crest of the pines with flame. Just a few minutes of transfiguration and revelation, and it is gone. I wonder if John Foster ever spent a winter in Mistawis, said Valancy. Not likely, scoffed Barney. People who write tosh like that generally write it in a warm house on some smug city street. You are too hard on John Foster, said Valancy severely. No one could have written that little paragraph I read you last night without having seen it first, you know he couldn't. I didn't listen to it, said Barney morosely. You know I told you I wouldn't. Then you've got to listen to it now, persisted Valancy. She made him stand still on his snowshoes while she repeated it. She is a rare artist, this old mother nature, who works for the joy of working and not in any spirit of vain show. Today the fir woods are a symphony of greens and grays, so subtle that you cannot tell where one shade begins to be the other. Gray trunk, green bough, gray-green moss above the white, gray-shadowed floor. Yet the old gypsy doesn't like unrelieved monotones. She must have a dash of color. See it. A broken dead fir bough, of a beautiful red-brown, swinging among the beards of moss. Good Lord, do you learn all that fellow's books by heart, 
was Barney's disgusted reaction as he strode off. John Foster's books were all that saved my soul alive the past five years, averred Valency. Oh, Barney, look at that exquisite filigree of snow in the furrows of that old elm tree trunk. When they came out to the lake they changed from snowshoes to skates and skated home. For a wonder Valency had learned, when she was a little schoolgirl, to skate on the pond behind the Deerwood School. She never had any skates of her own, but some of the other girls had lent her theirs and she seemed to have a natural knack of it. Uncle Benjamin had once promised her a pair of skates for Christmas, but when Christmas came he had given her rubbers instead. She had never skated since she grew up, but the old trick came back quickly, and glorious were the hours she and Barney spent skimming over the white lakes and past the dark islands where the summer cottages were closed and silent. Tonight they flew down Mistawis before the wind, in an exhilaration that crimsoned Valency's cheeks under her white tam. And at the end was her dear little house, on the island of pines, with a coating of snow on its roof, sparkling in the moonlight. Its windows glinted impishly at her in the stay gleams. Looks exactly like a picture book, doesn't it? said Barney. They had a lovely Christmas. No rush. No scramble. No niggling attempts to make ends meet. No wild effort to remember whether she hadn't given the same kind of present to the same person two Christmases before, no mob of last-minute shoppers, no dreary family reunions where she sat mute and unimportant, no attacks of nerves. They decorated the blue castle with pine boughs, and Valency made delightful little tinsel stars and hung them up amid the greenery. She cooked a dinner to which Barney did full justice, while Good Luck and Banjo picked the bones. A land that can produce a goose like that is an admirable land, vowed Barney. Canada forever. And they drank to the Union Jack a bottle of dandelion wine that cousin Georgiana had given Valency along with the bedspread. One never knows, cousin Georgiana had said solemnly, when one may need a little stimulant. Barney had asked Valency what she wanted for a Christmas present. Something frivolous and unnecessary, said Valency, who had got a pair of galoshes last Christmas and two long-sleeved, woolen undervests the year before. And so on back. To her delight, Barney gave her a necklace of pearl beads. Valency had wanted a string of milky pearl beads, like congealed moonshine, all her life. And these were so pretty. All that worried her was that they were really too good. They must have cost a great deal, fifteen dollars, at least. Could Barney afford that? She didn't know a thing about his finances. She had refused to let him buy any of her clothes, she had enough for that, she told him, as long as she would need clothes. In a round, black jar on the chimney piece Barney put money for their household expenses, always enough. The jar was never empty, though Valency never caught him replenishing it. He couldn't have much, of course, and that necklace, but Valency tossed care aside. She would wear it and enjoy it. It was the first pretty thing she had ever had. Chapter 32 New Year The old, shabby, inglorious outlived calendar came down. The new one went up. January was a month of storms. It snowed for three weeks on end. The thermometer went miles below zero and stayed there. But, as Barney and Valency pointed out to each other, there were no mosquitoes. And the roar and crackle of their big fire drowned the howls of the north wind. Good luck and Banjo waxed fat and developed resplendent coats of thick, silky fur. Nip and Tuck had gone. But they'll come back in spring, promised Barney. There was no monotony. Sometimes they had dramatic little private spats that never even thought of becoming quarrels. Sometimes Roaring Abel dropped in, for an evening or a whole day, with his old tartan cap and his long red beard coated with snow. He generally brought his fiddle and played for them, to the delight of all except Banjo, who would go temporarily insane and retreat under Valency's bed. Sometimes Abel and Barney talked while Valency made candy for them, 
sometimes they sat and smoked in silence a la Tennyson and Carlyle, until the blue castle reeked and Valency fled to the open. Sometimes they played checkers fiercely and silently the whole night through. Sometimes they all ate the russet apples Abel had brought, while the jolly old clock ticked the delightful minutes away. A plate of apples, an open fire, and a jolly good book whereon to Luke, are a fair substitute for heaven, vowed Barney. Anyone can have the streets of gold. Let's have another whack at Carmen. It was easier now for the Sterlings to believe Valency of the dead. Not even dim rumors of her having been over at the port came to trouble them, though she and Barney used to skate there occasionally to see a movie and eat hot dogs shamelessly at the corner stand afterwards. Presumably none of the Sterlings ever thought about her, except cousin Georgiana, who used to lie awake worrying about poor Doss. Did she have enough to eat? Was that dreadful creature good to her? Was she warm enough at nights? Valency was quite warm at nights. She used to wake up and revel silently in the coziness of those winter nights on that little island in the frozen lake. The nights of other winters had been so cold and long. Valency hated to wake up in them and think about the bleakness and emptiness of the day that had passed and the bleakness and emptiness of the day that would come. Now, she almost counted that night lost on which she didn't wake up and lie awake for half an hour just being happy, while Barney's regular breathing went on beside her, and through the open door the smoldering brands in the fireplace winked at her in the gloom. It was very nice to feel a little lucky cat jump up on your bed in the darkness and snuggle down at your feet, purring, but Banjo would be sitting darly by himself out in front of the fire like a brooding demon. At such moments Banjo was anything but canny, but Valency loved his uncanniness. The side of the bed had to be right against the window. There was no other place for it in the tiny room. Valency, lying there, could look out of the window, through the big pine boughs that actually touched it, away up Mistawis, white and lustrous as a pavement of pearl, or dark and terrible in the storm. Sometimes the pine boughs tapped against the panes with friendly signals. Sometimes she heard the little hissing whisper of snow against them right at her side. Some nights the whole outer world seemed given over to the empery of silence, then came nights when there would be a majestic sweep of wind in the pines, nights of dear starlight when it whistled freakishly and joyously around the blue castle, brooding nights before storm when it crept along the floor of the lake with a low, wailing cry of boding and mystery. Valency wasted many perfectly good sleeping hours in these delightful communings. But she could sleep as long in the morning as she wanted to. Nobody cared. Barney cooked his own breakfast of bacon and eggs and then shut himself up in Bluebeard's chamber till supper time. Then they had an evening of reading and talk. They talked about everything in this world and a good many things in other worlds. They laughed over their own jokes until the blue castles re-echoed. You do laugh beautifully, Barney told her once. It makes me want to laugh just to hear you laugh. There's a trick about your laugh, as if there were so much more fun back of it that you wouldn't let out. Did you laugh like that before you came to Mistawi's, Moonlight? I never laughed at all, really. I used to giggle foolishly when I felt I was expected to. But now, the laugh just comes. It struck Valency more than once that Barney himself laughed a great deal oftener than he used to and that his laugh had changed. It had become wholesome. She rarely heard the little cynical note in it now. Could a man laugh like that who had crimes on his conscience? Yet Barney must have done something. Valency had indifferently made up her mind as to what he had done. She concluded he was a defaulting bank cashier. She had found in one of Barney's books an old clipping cut from a Montreal paper in which a vanished, defaulting cashier was described. The description applied to Barney, as well as to half a dozen other men Valency knew, and from some casual remarks he had dropped from time to time she concluded he knew Montreal rather well. Valency had it all figured out in the back of her mind. Barney had been in a bank. He was tempted to take some money to speculate meaning, of course, to put it back. He had got in deeper and deeper, 
until he found there was nothing for it but flight. It had happened so to scores of men. He had, Valency was absolutely certain, never meant to do wrong. Of course, the name of the man in the clipping was Bernard Craig. But Valency had always thought Snaith was an alias. Not that it mattered. Valency had only one unhappy night that winter. It came in late March when most of the snow had gone and Nip and Tuck had returned. Barney had gone off in the afternoon for a long, woodland tramp, saying he would be back by dark if all went well. Soon after he had gone it had begun to snow. The wind rose and presently Mistawis was in the grip of one of the worst storms of the winter. It tore up the lake and struck at the little house. The dark angry woods on the mainland scowled at Valency, menace in the toss of their boughs, threats in their windy gloom, terror in the roar of their hearts. The trees on the island crouched in fear. Valency spent the night huddled on the rug before the fire, her face buried in her hands, when she was not vainly peering from the oriole in a futile effort to see through the furious smoke of wind and snow that had once been blue-dimpled Mistawis. Where was Barney? Lost on the merciless lakes? Sinking exhausted in the drifts of the pathless woods? Valency died a hundred deaths that night and paid in full for all the happiness of her blue castle. When morning came the storm broke and cleared, the sun shone gloriously over Mistawis, and at noon Barney came home. Valency saw him from the oriole as he came around a wooded point, slender and black against the glistening white world. She did not run to meet him. Something happened to her knees and she dropped down on Banjo's chair. Luckily Banjo got out from under in time, his whiskers bristling with indignation. Barney found her there, her head buried in her hands. Barney, I thought you were dead, she whispered. Barney hooted. After two years of the Klondike did you think a baby storm like this could get me? I spent the night in that old lumber shanty over by Muskoka. A bit cold but snug enough. Little goose. Your eyes look like burnt holes in a blanket. Did you sit up here all night worrying over an old woodsman like me? Yes, said Valency. I, couldn't help it. The storm seemed so wild. Anybody might have been lost in it. When, I saw you, come round the point, there, something happened to me. I don't know what. It was as if I had died and come back to life. I can't describe it any other way.